sunny spaces, smiling faces, happy places. But every sunny space holds a shadow. Behind every smile are sharp teeth. And every happy place has something sinister lurking just below the surface. Welcome to We Saw the Devil, the podcast diving deep into the chilling realms of true crime. Join your host, Robin, as she unravels mysteries that have left investigators baffled and armchair sleuths obsessed. Be forewarned, dear listener, We Saw the Devil is not for the faint of heart. Our unflinching exploration will take you to the darkest corners of the psyche and through the unimaginable depths of human darkness to unearth stark secrets to the harsh light of day. Nothing will be left untouched. Are you ready? Are you sure? We saw the devil. Hey y'all, it's Robin. I am back with the second episode of today. If you missed out, uh, I did post about a 10 minute episode earlier this morning covering the breaking news of Suzanne Morphew, the missing Colorado mom. Uh, she went missing three and a half years ago. Her remains have been found and positively identified. I'm so thrilled for her brother and her family. And yeah, we will be keeping uh, keeping tabs on that case. If you guys recall, her husband, Barry Morphew, is the prime suspect in this. He almost went to trial way back before they had found her remains. That case was dismissed without prejudice, meaning the charges can be filed again. So a lot of a lot of news in this case is going to be coming in the upcoming days. But I did post that episode earlier this morning. And here we are back with Chris Chan, heading into episode 12. In the previous episode, we left off in January of 2012, with Chris and Barb sitting on top of some felony charges. Chris and Barb both had somehow hit Mike Snyder outside of the game place. Barb lost her mind and attacked a police officer as he was trying to arrest Chris. It was a whole hot mess express. And after this, Chris had largely gone offline, except for a newly created Facebook account, which he had recently announced his new sweetheart search. And somehow Chris had gotten it into his head, most likely via Bob and Barb, that Megan Schroeder was the cause for all of the trolling. And he begins to post to Facebook constantly. He lays off of YouTube. He stays vastly quiet on the quickie but he just begins to constantly post on Facebook. And he demands that anyone who knows where Megan is, quote unquote, present her to me. And that's actually quite terrifying because it was clear that he was becoming obsessed with her again in the I want to actually physically harm her way. So providing some additional information on why he thinks Megan was behind it, Chris posted the following to Facebook. Quote, The thing with Megan is a major lot to elaborate. In short, though, I had little knowledge and understanding of details when I thought she was a victim. The trolling started before November 2007. Conversations between her and Mr. Snyder were overheard by my mother. I was, from her perspective, weird, different, my good intentions greatly misunderstood, stalker-like, etc. Put it all together, she is the seed of all of that evil. Both my parents knew I was ignorant for the long time up till now, end quote. If that scenario actually did play out in real life, Megan was basically talking to the manager of the game place and being like, help me. I am being assaulted and stalked. I am uncomfortable. And Chris's mother, Barb, and eventually Bob were like, what an evil bitch. She is responsible for my poor, poor, poor Chris's hurt fee-fees of not being allowed to go into the game place. I mean, it's actually sincerely fucked up. And two days after that original post, he posted her last known home address, as well as the names of her family members. He said, I found Megan's last known or possibly present home address. He then posted it online. He then lists her associated contacts. Keep it hush-hush because I require her to be brought closer to me, my mother and Rob Bell, for questioning. Thank you. So he officially, because of this, is again obsessed with Megan Schroeder and fully doxxed her online. Also in January, Chris lamented his upcoming birthday, upset that he would still be a virgin. Remember, that's all Chris cares about. He wrote, quote, February is coming up. My birthday's on the 24th. I'll be 30. Still a virgin. 
I mean, most people lose their Virgin Marys before 21. My mother lost hers in her high school years. My father lost his at the age of 27. The 40-year-old virgin. Damn it. Abstinence is a very crappy joke. It only leads to growing, growing, growing emotional pain over the extended time. End quote. Chris's birthday did in fact come and go without celebration, at least from Chris. The Quickie, however, released a treasure trove of Tom Girl videos that Chris had made for Jackie. You know, the ones that we got in the last episode, the Red Main Deer, Cake Farts, all of the others. This is the upload uh, that gave us those videos. And y'all, listen to this. If you're wondering, well, just how famous was Chris? I, you know, I didn't hear about him and I was online at that time. In March of 2012, Sega, you know, Sega Genesis, Sega Corporation, the billion dollar gaming company, they posted a YouTube video showing new merch. It showed two employees at their corporate headquarters taking some plush dolls and toys out of boxes. The guy picks something up and the girl goes, Sonichu? The guy laughed really sarcastically and was like, no. Again, if you were even lightly on the internet, it's likely that you came into or witnessed or saw, stumbled across, a Chris Chan joke somewhere. Seeing as though Chris was not on YouTube, the vast majority of this episode is going to contain Facebook posts. So, on March 27th, he wrote, I need some sex. I am no different from anyone else on that topic. I get horny. I think about it often. I'm dreaming of inserting my rod A into female slot V, followed by some lost genetics. Being in an adult version sucks. Abstinence is a joke. I am lonely. I am tired of being ignored and overlooked in public by women. I need some sex. A 30-year dry spell? I would invite you over, but my place and my life is still a mess. A couple days later, he wrote, My court date is coming up, and there is a risk of me either having the charges from Snyder drop or me landing in jail. And if my destiny is jail, I will starve myself. I do not want to die a virgin either. I need help immediately. Please send her my way in person. Time for polite conversation and getting to know optional. And y'all, someone did, in fact, send a woman Chris's way. Now, we are sex worker positive on this podcast. Sex work is real work, and there is no judgment here. But someone put Chris in contact with two different sex workers. An unknown person from Chris's life got onto the good old website back pages back in the day when it was up and provided Chris with a list of sex workers to choose from. Chris did end up calling two of them. And yes, he located someone who went by the name Mia Ham, and he finally had sex for the first time. We know this because the postcoital email from Chris to this person ended up leaking online. And it's very, very, very graphic. And he details exactly what happened between him and this woman. And I'm not going to read that on this episode. But if you are interested in finding it, shoot our Instagram a message. And I am happy to provide the direct link to you. In short, the lady went by the name Mia Ham. Uh, it was $150. And afterwards, Chris claims that they laid and talked and cuddled. And she told him that he was one of the best that she's ever had, that he had a huge penis. And he then went into explicit detail about that. You know, the, the typical Chris Chan narcissism knows no bounds. He then also claims that they had a phone conversation the next day where she once again uh, just basically pumped him up and said that he was the best ever. Also in the beginning of April, Chris and his mother are officially indicted on felony trespassing charges. And they actually face a good bit of jail time if they reoffend. Considering the fact that Chris could not, for whatever reason, for the life of him, stay away from the game place, and particularly Mike Snyder, a lot of trolls worried about the future there. People were making wagers on whether he would break the order of protection that Mike had filed against him. On both April 4th and April 13th, Chris makes posts across all of his social media accounts that he finally lost his virginity. But the high from that didn't last long. Because within a week, he was incredibly depressed from not having a sweetheart. He posted on April 16th onto Facebook, quote, just lost two hours of life in court waiting for hearing date set up. Really tired. Wish Snyder dead from his own self-stress. I need sleep. Then on April 26th, y'all, I find this to be hilarious. 
So Chris posts online that he's going to go to the Fashion Square Mall uh, there in Charlottesville that next Saturday, and he's going to hold his sweetheart sign, and he's going to find a girlfriend. He legit posts that he's going to go search for a girlfriend at the mall on Saturday. But wait, it was a ruse. On that Saturday, April 30th, Chris did not go to the mall. In fact, he had never had the intention of going. Instead, in his mind, he achieved some huge win against the trolls by setting them up to go, not going, and then changing the voice message on his cell phone. I'm going to play the recording of his voicemail greeting now. And I don't know why, but that makes me laugh every single time. Like, it's actually a pretty sick burn because, you know, whole groups of people went to the mall to go Chris spotting. If Chris ever let it be known where he was going, whether it was the mall, a restaurant or bar, at this point, people would travel to uh, anonymously sit and watch him. And side note, back to Chris being the most documented person on the planet. You know, people literally have years worth of actual recordings of his voice greetings because of course they do. But I mean, Chris's phone number has pretty much always been public. And so as part of Christery, they would record the phone calls and then create a database of his greetings for his voicemail. That's how insane Christorians are. But I digress. May ends up kicking off with Chris publicly bragging about losing his virginity except he pretty much gave it away that he paid a woman for sex. So it's actually not, it actually doesn't end up being the flex that he thought that it would uh, for the trolls. Now I'm including the next part because it provides some additional context to how Chris views men and women. So we're in 2012, back in 2007, when Chris was actively going to the game place, there was a guy that also went there named Daniel Mems. People called him just Mems. One of the reasons that 4chan took to Chris and Sonichu so fast is because Mims took pictures of him drawing. Like, Mims was there in the game place with Megan, with all the other people, with Mike Snyder, with Chris. They would play Pokemon and, um, and stuff there. Mims would take pictures of Chris, and then his friend Lucas would actually take them and then anonymously post them up to 4chan and on Reddit. Well, Lucas and Mims were there from the very beginning. And don't forget, I mentioned in the very first episode, Megan was so creeped out by Chris being all over her sexually inappropriate that she would find safety with guys, right? Like she would go over and hang out with other guys. Those guys were Mims and Lucas. They ended up basically bringing Megan into their kind of like group in a protective way and ended up remaining friends with her long, long after. But in any case, Chris discovered that he had been posted to 4chan pretty quickly back in 2007. And he even brought Bob and Barb to the game place to tell on Mims. Well, Mims had been off of Chris's radar for years, at least three of them, at least three years. But suddenly on one of Chris's crusades against Megan, he must have remembered uh, Mims and Lucas. He posted a picture of Mims and said how he became close to the quote, queen of the trolls. Also during this time, Chris's Facebook account was constantly accessed by trolls. Not necessarily hacked, but just constantly accessed. Because if you ever wonder why all of his accounts are constantly hacked, it's not because people are sitting there trying to figure out the password combination like it's a like they're cracking a safe. It's because he uses the same password every single time, or he gives the password to people that he absolutely should not give the password to. Well, trolls accessed his old Facebook posts that he'd archived, you know, like deleted, archived. And at one point, Chris made a post demanding that his Facebook friends go kill Mims's girlfriend. Why? Because Chris wanted to take away the possession that made Mims feel the most happy. Chris views women solely as possessions. He has this very archaic, antiquated, conservative belief that women are made for sex and childbearing. And that is it. This should be explicitly clear by now in the previous 11 episodes of this series. 
you know, all of his comic characters are the female characters. Sure, they have superpowers and they fight and they find victory. But afterwards, they pretty much solely exist to take off their clothes and fuck the male characters. And Chris provide children for the men and the male characters. And y'all, here's the thing. When it comes to Chris, it's always a question of wondering whether he knows what he's doing and saying is wrong. I think that so many people, justice system included, criminal justice system included, they just feel like Chris's autism doesn't allow him to view or understand what's right and what's wrong, and he has no ability to differentiate it. And I think the biggest key here is the fact that when he writes and when he draws uh, gratuitous sex scenes in his comic, he adds disclaimers like, I believe in women's rights. This is meant as being respectful. He adds these series of disclaimers on his own accord because he knows that people are going to be made uncomfortable by it and that it doesn't look good. The optics aren't good. He knows what he's doing is sketchy. He just doesn't care enough not to do it because that's how he actually feels. And the same with women he interacts with on the internet or in person. He'll make highly inappropriate comments about sex or their bodies, but he'll follow it up with, I'm attracted to body and mine. I'm not like the other guys. In an attempt to cover up his lechery. So yeah, he actually publicly called out for a hit on this guy's girlfriend, on Mims's girlfriend, to an innocent person who had nothing to do with a kid who hurt his feelings back in 2007. And to me, this shows a sincerely dark and dangerous side of Chris. Here we have, in a matter of like a day or two, him doxing Megan Schroeder, providing her home address for the entirety of the internet, telling people to bring her to him, and then calling for a hit on his ex-friend, you know, ex-acquaintance, uh, his ex-acquaintance's girlfriend. Absolutely awful. And two things of note happened in May. So Chris and Barb get two new dogs. If you recall, Chris had the dog Patty, and he was very, 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 very sad about that dog. And so Chris and Barb get two new dogs to help with the grief of Bob's loss. They're two beagle puppies named Clover and Snoopy. And let me just say that if you're an animal lover, you're not going to have a good time in future episodes. And then secondly, Chris begins to spend a lot of time in the quickie forums, which is unlike him. Uh, There's the quickie, which is like the Wikipedia like database covering Christian. And then there's the quickie forums where people talk about Chris's life and behavior. Uh, He registered under a false name and joined in on the discussion. Because Christian doesn't write or type or think the way that most of us do, It became immediately clear within three sentences of his first post, and everyone immediately recognized him. So the trolls devised a plan, a way to troll him, of course. They used Photoshop to create fake slanderous posters about Chris Chan, and then Photoshopped them onto places there in in, uh, Charlottesville. Places that Chris would frequent, like the game place, McDonald's, the bank. They did this publicly, describing how they were all meeting at the mall to create the posters before going out into the community to post them. And obviously, it wasn't real. It was all Photoshop, and it wasn't really happening. One sign said, CWC Chandler Ruckersville, Sexual Deviant, CSonachu.com. Another said, Chris has no empathy, so show him none in return, 2012. And that's a throw out to the upcoming court case. They were waiting for their court date. And Chris didn't leave the house to go investigate these posters. He just believed that they were real. Uh, He posted the pictures on Facebook and then asked his friends to scope them out and go see if they were actually there. Chris also becomes kind of a sad sack. He becomes depressed again. On June 4th, he posted, My only great purpose now is for my mother, our two cats, and our two puppies. No girlfriend, sweetheart, as freaking promised from multiple dreams. For Christian Weston Chandler, only hatred, fear, discrimination, and a whole wide world of extreme, unjustifiable shit lies in the wake of my once good name. Nobody really, truly understands me. I am sad, confused, lost. I do not understand. You almost start to feel bad for Chris at this time because he is really sincerely disturbed. And then a couple days later, he posted in broken English, quote, I have just been discriminated 
again at the McDonald's at Forest Lakes. Do not go there either, or if you do, throw newspaper in the damn old bitchy black woman's face. You see, June was the groveling month for Chris. He was sad, depressed, and lonely. His words, not mine. So lonely, in fact, that he made many Facebook posts about it almost every damn day. Loneliness, trolls, and poor old Mike Snyder. On June 29th, he posted the following to Facebook, and I'm just going to read the very last paragraph of a whole damn novel that he wrote for Status Update. He says, And even worse, I have been encountering people who started hating me, in reference to the recent bans from those two McDonald's. That now makes five places that I have been and am banned from around here, counting Fashion Square, Damn That Man a Jerk, Piedmont Virginia Community College, Damn Mary Lee Walsh, and The Place, Children Fucking Damned Michael Snyder. I seriously have been publicly invisible for years. The damn trolling stupids have manipulated me, smeared my once good name through the worst mud, muck, and bodily fluids, mentally and emotionally raped me continuously, made the worst imaginable reputation of me on the internet, and relayed that into offline life in gossip, rumors, and presidentially grand fucked up campaigns. My mind is comparably as worse off as a terribly bad drug addict, constantly blank, irritable, untalkative, ignorant to most social cues, lost in life, yada yada, except I do not do any of those drugs or smoke. And I just do not understand most people and a lot of shit in life. He was banned once again from the mall. He was banned from the two McDonald's. He was banned from the game place. He couldn't go back to his old college campus that he liked to go to for the reasons of being creepy and combative in all of those places. The same day that he posted that damn everybody, blah, blah, blah. I'm so sad and lonely post. He posted I pray that someone else will plant a bomb in the game and hobby place and blow the whole damn store up. It does not deserve to ever have a Seville in its name above its accursed, sullied, trolling stupid, hellfire entrance and doors. Death to Michael Snyder too. That bastard, among bastards, ruined and destroyed my life, emotions, and being. Chris is openly calling for death and murder at this point. And after everything, the sexual harassment of Megan Schroeder, the blatant acts of racism against young black kids who just wanted to play fucking Pokemon, outbursts, physical violence, name calling, vehicular assault. Chris legitimately believes at this point that Mike Snyder and Megan Schroeder were working together in some like underground, like secret Knights Templar troll ring along with all of the trolls that they had personally recruited to victimize Chris and ruin his life forever. On July 10th, Chris and Barb were arraigned. And we know what happened, not because of Chris making a post, but because two trolls flew. They literally bought plane tickets and flew to Charlottesville, Virginia, to sit in the courtroom for their arraignment. Cyan and Indigo. Two dudes who were following Chris Chan, and they just wanted to go there and see it in person. So more or less, there was a plea bargain, and Mike Snyder said that he didn't want to see either of them have jail time or criminal records with felonies. In addition, the court mandated that Chris must attend psychiatric treatment and evaluation. Barb and Chris's high-powered attorney, you know, Rob Bell, the uh, Republican politician and attorney that Barb pretty much gave all of Bob's uh, inheritance, like his money that he left over for them, uh, pretty much gave this attorney all of her money. Uh, so he advocated for community service to quote unquote reintegrate Chris into society. Barbara also received community service and two years of probation. Chris ended up receiving one year of probation community service, and he had to comply with all psychiatric treatment and evaluation deemed necessary by the court. Chris was very much not happy with the outcome of this at all. In fact, he pouted throughout his entire appearance in court. Ten days later, Chris made a Facebook post and was still salty as hell about the Mike Snyder incident. He said, and when Rob Bell introduced me to the judge as an adult, high-functioning child, I did make a silent comment between me and my mother in response to that. S in response, that statement was an oxymoron. It is invalid. I mean, I am an adult. Do not call me a child. 
The statement should have been high functioning autistic adult, individual or person. And anyway, I still feel like I have lost because Snyder is getting paid indirectly from me and my mother through our insurance. He won that goddamn bribing bastard. I wish him dead from either a heart attack or gunshot murder. And this is a common theme that you're going to start seeing more and more and more and more with Christian. Chris wishing death or harm upon people that he doesn't particularly care for or agree with. <clears throat> August and September of 2012 are pretty much fruitless in terms of Chris Jury. Chris continues making posts about his new dogs and then also how lonely he is. His sadness, his sadness. Chris continues making posts about his new dogs and also about how lonely he is, his sadness uh, over his father's death, and other things. October comes with Snorlax's 71st birthday, Snorlax being the name trolls had given Barb uh, back in 2008 when that photo of her uh, asleep in a chair uh, was posted online and went viral. Chris also posted an updated picture to Facebook showing that he has dyed his hair blonde and also grown it out shoulder length. So now... Uh, the, the Tom girl phase is still going strong here and his hair looks so fucking weird uh, because it's cut short in the bangs. It's cut short like a man in the, and just in the bangs, but then on the sides and the back it's grown out and it's thin and scraggly and it's not quite a mullet, but it's definitely something that you might find in a Florida trailer park on November 26. He made an angry post feeling down again, miss my dad. I wish I could go back to 1999 and change my future. Hating the male population for taking all of the women, leaving me lost, confused, and with absolutely no women to choose from. I feel like I want to bully every young adult male I pass by, shouting at them, hey, quit stealing women. And then we start to enter the brony phase. You see, back when Chris met Megan Schroeder, he didn't watch the same anime or shows that she did like sailor moon my little pony those are things that she introduced to chris that he went along with and liked and became obsessed with because megan was into it chris's parents were older and their influence on chris was like bob was obsessed with old school jazz and jazz records and old tv shows gilligan's island stuff like that that was where chris was coming from so when Megan disappeared from Chris's life due to, again, the horrific sexual harassment, Chris mostly put all of these interests on the back burner because it was never really, you know, something that he had gotten into to begin with. It was strictly because of women. So fast forward to November of 2012. Some troll had made an eHarmony profile basically listing out all of Chris's interests. Chris eventually takes a picture of himself and captions it on the top, True American. And on the bottom, the caption reads, and brony. And he posts it to Facebook. The troll Kim Wilson asks Chris, what's a brony? And he replies, a male who enjoys my little pony. So this is also the beginning of Chris entering the brony fandom, which more on that um, when we get to like 2017, 2018. But Chris becomes quite a fixture in the uh, brony culture. And there are some brony documentaries uh, out there. It is a wild fandom, wild and weird fandom. So I suggest looking up. There's a couple documentaries on YouTube on it as well. It's fascinating. Come December on New Year's Eve, Chris makes a Facebook post that says, quote, my New Year's resolution for years has been to find a woman friend and make her into my sweetheart from the ground up. Sadly, this is still long overdue to be done. And I have mostly been feeling depressed, stressed, and paranoid. So I do not really have any new resolutions at all. Okay, so we are finally entering 2013. 2012 is probably one of the quietest years of Chris's life, but I am still not including every little item that happens to Chris. I'm, I'm trying to keep it within the narrative here. So 2013 is the fifth year of the official beginning of Christery. And look at everything that's happened in those five years, y'all. My God. Just think of everything that we've covered so far. 
January of 2013 is relatively boring. It's just Chris carrying on doing community service and likely going to therapy, but that's that information is not public at this time. In February, Chris is deep in his obsession with My Little Pony, and he also turned 31 years old. Now, have you ever heard of Tara Strong, the voice artist? Even though you may not recognize the name, trust me when I say that you've heard her work. She voiced Timmy Turner from The Fairly Odd Parents, Bubbles from The Powerpuff Girls, my favorite, uh, Raven from Teen Titans, Twilight Sparkle, like the main character from My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Batgirl, Harley Quinn, and Dill Pickles from Rugrats, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more. If you are 40 and under, Tara Strong has voiced some part, if not most of, your childhood. The woman is a fucking icon and basically royalty. So while Chris was watching My Little Pony and entering into his, uh, his sweet brony phase, he noticed that Tara Strong was doing an anti-bullying campaign. And she was part of a parody bullying video using the voice of Twilight Sparkle. Of course, it had an anti-bullying message at its core behind the parody portion. And in all honesty, it's likely due to Chris's autism that he took the video at face value. And Tara Strong's involvement in this video both enraged and disappointed him. So where does he go to bitch about it? He went to Facebook and he wrote this absolute diatribe and manifesto slamming Tara Strong and demanding that she explain herself. Now, he did not intend for that to be sent to Tara Strong. That was kind of like written diarrhea of his mind of how upset that he was over it, relating it to himself and the troll journey and the bullying that he had endured. So one of Chris's Facebook friends saw the post and decided to just send it directly to Tara Strong's Facebook page. Now, Tara Strong is famous. Is she Jason Momoa famous? No, but she's still quite famous. And y'all, Tara Strong actually replied the very next morning. She said, quote, I don't think I've ever seen anyone put an ugly spin on something this outrageously for their own attention. Anyone who follows me knows that I'm on a huge anti-bullying platform and even wrote and produced a song about it. All my quote unquote trolling, as we on Twitter call it, is completely adorable and makes people smile. Christian's article makes me angry and disappointed. Hope I never meet the guy. Now, in Chris's mind, Tara Strong's response was a personal attack on him. Like, personal attack. Imagine meeting one of your heroes, and they said you angered them, make them disappointed, and they hope they never meet you. Chris just simply did not understand the concept of parody A troll forwarded his thoughts to Tara, and then her response, like her responding to this, placed her square in Chris's crosshairs for years onward. But Chris had pretty much been staying off the internet and not posting videos during this time, uh, other than just still rabid Facebook posts, and there at this point was no video content and no phone calls that I can play the audio for you guys of. Now, that doesn't mean that there wasn't video footage of Chris. Do you guys remember the MTV show Failosophy? It was hosted by Hassan Minaj, and he would have people on like Pete Davidson, Nikki Glaser, and basically they would show weird and funny clips from the internet, and then they would play games and talk about them and laugh. Like, who who out of these three would you date? Who would you have as a roommate? Or who would you call the police on? And that's the game that they played, because on March 8th, 2013, an episode of Failosophy on MTV, you guys, featured a picture of Chris in his Tom Girl phase. If you Google Chris Chan Philosophy, you can watch. It's like a four-minute clip. You can watch the segment with uh, where they use Chris's picture. The picture that they use is the picture that I actually used for a cover photo of a previous episode, the one with Chris in the white sports bra holding up a fake gun, and he has uh, his genitals blacked out because he was naked. Uh, That was one of his first big Tom girl pictures that he sent to Jackie. That's the photo that they used. In any case, they used that picture and they played that game. And you can imagine how Chris felt about it when a male comedian and guest said that he would date and marry Chris because he was the most womanly. Chris was very displeased. 
On March 28th, Chris posted to Facebook that he was tired of hearing about DOMA and gay marriage, Defense of Marriage Act and, and DOMA. And I mean, I'm going to be honest here and I might piss off some people, but this is the God's honest truth. It's typical patriarchal, religious based, whatever, shitty man syndrome. You know, the I love lesbians, wink, wink. They don't bother me. It's just the gay men that disgust me, you know, and it all boils down to the fact that they can't jack off to the men. Chris is basically no different than this. He said, quote, another thing that really grinds my gears. I mean, no personal offense, and I am for lesbians being together in their marriage, but I am really offended with the damn homosexual males. So I am like 50-50 on the current topic in the newspapers, but I am 100% sick, tired, and disgusted of having to read at least the headlines in the post. Talk about something else already. His friend Anna called him out over it, but Chris throws out red herrings, and he just doesn't get it. And the troll, Kim Wilson, actually fully calls him out on it, and then actually ends the conversation with, now this is a troll, mind you, ends the conversation with, Chris, you really need to get over your sexism because women do not find that shit attractive. April of 2013 is largely uneventful, except for Chris taking on the new hairstyle of pigtails. That thinning, scraggly, unwashed, smelly hair that he has bleached and dyed into oblivion at this point in pigtails. And Chris became bored and incredibly lonely with nowhere to go. Nowhere to go because he'd been banned from all of the places that made him happy, like McDonald's, Walmart, the game place. He literally had nowhere to go in terms of personal enrichment of you know, anywhere that he would be interested in. And so naturally, he took to the internet to complain about that piece. On April 4th, he said, quote, I, Christian Weston Chandler, fully no longer want to ever forever approach the game and hobby place. It truly is the breeding and meeting place for trolls and cyber bullies. Long before October 2007, there were very few people who would have had anything on me personally worldwide because those people only existed locally to me and with constant in-person communication with me. Those people only existed at the place and the very first person who turned troll against me is none other than Megan Schroeder. She conscripted Snyder, Mims, and everyone else against me. And when my family, as I started getting close with identifying them as our perpetrators and the prime trolls, Snyder was looking for a reason to ban me, and so he did. Megan Schroeder is the prime queen of the trolls. The place is truly a troll cyberbully breeding and meeting place, and I never forever want anything to do with it. The place should definitely be destroyed and shut down for good. And I want to exact my fullest revenge and divine retribution with Megan Schroeder. She should be jailed and beaten up, that vile, wicked, traitorous bitch. Ramblings of a uh, sane person, right? So in May, Chris and his mother have hit dire financial straits. It becomes public that Chris has been looking around for a place to sell his father's vinyl collection. If you recall in the last episode, they pretty much immediately sold his TV. All of the money was gone because of the Rob Bell attorney fees. Then they were looking to sell the stamp collection, which Bob pretty much demanded and made sure that Chris would not sell his stamp collection. They were looking around trying to find someone to uh, to sell it to. Now, the house was paid off. So why were they not able to make it? Well, that's because Chris was still receiving his full tugboat aka his social security, but he was still spending all of his uh, social security money on toys and games. So they were forced into selling off some of Bob's stuff uh, because Barb wasn't getting that much money and Chris was too selfish to assist in paying for anything. And don't forget the hoarding situation, y'all. That house, if you remember in the last episode, the house has a bed bug problem. It has a scabies problem. They just brought two fucking innocent puppies into it. They have two cats in there. The litter box is constantly overflowing. With all of this going on, who does Chris blame for his financial woes? And inability to drive anywhere because he can't afford gas. Mike Snyder, obviously. On May 15th, he posted to Facebook, quote, I have had more freedom when my father was alive and I end up losing it when he passed away because now I got to serve my mother and protect her and everything. And I can blame that son of a bitch, Mike Snyder, for taking and wasting the money that my mom and I had soon gotten from my father's passing 
because he had to go send us to court for all the goddamn shit of his. Michael Snyder is a bastard to me and my mother for taking us to court. He essentially stole a lot of money from us indirectly. Chris quite literally stalked Mike Snyder and moved his car and hit Mike Snyder, not once, but then Barb got into the driver's seat and hit him too. Mike Snyder kept you from felony prison time and said, hey, I'm actually injured. Just please pay for my medical bills and we'll call it a day. Chris cannot not be the victim in this entire situation. But that wouldn't be the only thing that Chris would be upset about. In June, Chris learned that his half-brother, Cole Smithy, got married. And I know that I haven't mentioned Cole since the very beginning when Chris uh, began to go viral, when Chris and Cole had their talk. That was it. That talk via email. Uh, If you recall, Cole was the son of one of Barb's previous relationships. He left the home when Chris was a small child because he hated Bob. He called him like a vile Republican cur, old Republican cur. He left home at 16 and quite literally never looked back, but like once. He also made a bunch of different uh, accusations against Barb and uh, Bob and that they were into some weird stuff. So Chris and Barb learned that he had gotten married and this upset them so badly that it lured Chris out of his YouTube sabbatical and inspired him to record a video. Not aimed at Cole himself, mind you, because that would be too logical. No, aimed at a man by the name of John Kyle, Cole's brother-in-law, and the guitarist in the band that played at Cole's wedding. Someone who likely had no idea or clue as to the familial you know, issues going on within Cole's side of the family. So here's the audio from Chris's video where, again, he's addressing the wedding singer, more or less, and brother-in-law of trying to get in touch with Cole. I mean, this is terrifying. Hello, John Kyle. This is Christian Weston Chandler, Joseph Cole Smithy's half-brother. We share the same mother, Barbara Ann Weston Chandler. I understand that uh, you have performed recently at his... Wedding a few months ago? I have just learned this. Yeah, so he finally got married. Whoop de do for him. Oh, and thank him for the invitation that we never received. We would have RSVP'd sooner and actually come to the wedding had he actually invited me and our mother. Anyway, I am sending you this video response because I wish to inquire about his... Uh, current address so that my mother and I can at least be able to write to him personally because she does miss him very much. I've tried time and again to get his to contact him and get in touch with him and my mother talked to him. He never responds. Never responds. He should love his mother. She misses him. Nearly 72 years old. She does not need to be treated like a piece of dirt. She is a lot better than that. Regardless of what anybody has lied to Cole about. Everything he heard from anybody outside the house, even Jerry, his father-in-law, or Jack, I think, was the name of his real father... They all lie to him about what, how about the kind of person Barbara Ann is and was. So at least have the common decency to re- to reply to us, brother. It's been like what over a decade since the last, the final ever family reunion in Red Oak. Everybody hates us there now since Karina died. <sighs> Anyway, uh, if you know his address, John, please refer to me, relate it to me, and you may share this video with Cole as well next time you talk to him. Thank you, and have a good day. Imagine if you had Chris as a half-sibling, and you go your entire life managing, you know, you get out of the house, you stay away from your mom, it's, they're all toxic, become successful, you become slightly successful in your own right, you're marrying someone that's stable, that has a good bit of money, and then all of a sudden, 
a YouTube video appears with Chris in full blown Tom girl phase talking to the guitarist in your band, trying to get your address and phone number. Chris waited around for about a couple weeks, but he could not get Cole Smith out of his mind. And let me go ahead. There were 11 tweets on June 29th, 2013. He sent Cole 11 tweets on Twitter. Rest in peace, Twitter. Now X, I guess. 11 tweets between 6.30 and 7 p.m. Hey, you ought to be over here putting bandages on our mom's holy buttocks. By the way, happy 50th birthday. Your mother is about 72. Y'all ought to celebrate together. Please either come over to Virginia and visit or send me your current home address so she can at least write to you, please. You ought to be here helping our mother so I can have my freedom to find my sweetheart. Hey, old timer, you're just starting. Why not get some notes from another, me or our mom? You think you're grand with your mental and physical handicaps. Me, mental, physical, and wrongfully possessing the worst internet reputation in all of history. Wrongfully handcuffed five times. Spent over 12 hours alone in solitary confining jail. With our own mother sharing the same jail time in another cell, cell blocks away. I have more mental agonies for a high-functioning autistic person than you could ever have imagined. Chris was upset that he was stuck at home with Barb and he felt like the world owed him a sweetheart and that his half-brother, who granted was Barb's son, that he should be there taking care of Barb so Chris can leave the nest like Cole did. And before we call it a day here, I'm going to read one last post. Remember the beagle puppies that Chris and Barb got? Well, again, they were constantly inside, never taken out, barely fed. The food that they were given was um, like chicken noodle cans of chicken noodle soup from Campbell's, like off brand. They weren't really even hardly fed dog food. They were utterly abused and neglected. There were scraps of newspaper all around the house, literal newspaper scraps sitting on top of the carpet, just thrown on the ground. And that's where they would urinate. So late June, Chris took a picture of one of the urine puddles in the house on that newspaper on the floor and posted it to Facebook. He said, one of my pups just peed and look how it came out shaped like a girl. And that is where we are going to stop today. (laughs) I feel like the episode has been long enough. And not only that, we have a lot to cover next week as well. If you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to follow on Instagram under We Saw the Devil podcast. That's where most of the updates go out. That's the one that I'm most active on. If you have any questions or want links to any of the pictures or voicemails or videos from the Chris Chan case, do not hesitate to reach out and just send a uh, send a message on Instagram. The website is we saw the devil.com. Beyond that, I will talk to you guys next week with the return of Iris. Oh, and I am doing an Ask Me Anything. I don't know if you guys saw, but I am doing an AMA. It's been a, been like two years since my last AMA. So if you have any questions for me, whether it's personally, about myself, about a case that I've covered, Chris Chan, horror movies, anything at all, uh, send your question to info at we saw the devil.com. Again, info at we saw the devil.com. And this weekend, uh, probably Saturday, I'm actually going to post a quick AMA uh, episode. Until next crime, y'all.